playing the Radical Latino Show. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands in the air for New York's very own. Latino is taking you to another level. Yo! What up, my people? Welcome back to another episode of the Radical Latino Show. It's your host, the Radical Latino. What is popping, my people? I hope everybody's having a wonderful quarantine day, quarantine week. I know a lot of us is going stir crazy, you know, having cabin fever and all that. Just I'm holding y'all down with some entertainment, some content, at least. You know what I'm saying? At least. Because, you know, this whole social distancing stuff is going crazy, you know, especially in New York right now. We just became the number one city with all this Corona virus outbreaks and all that, you know, so that's something I got to deal with. I'm outside, you know, running around with masks and all that gloves that look like a fucking ghetto ass doctor, you know what I'm saying? So. Oh, um, I'm glad that everybody's doing great out there. I'm glad that everybody is, you know, uh, you know, get, getting getting their health together and being, you know, quarantined or whatever. I don't know when this whole thing is going to last, but hopefully it stops soon. Everybody's talking about April might be the cutoff point, but I don't know. A couple of gyms are closing. Some other gyms are st- staying closed. A lot of a lot of people and businesses, you know, are closing down because of this whole thing. You know, some businesses are staying open, but other businesses are closing down. So I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Anyway, so um, before I get into anything, um, guys, remember, if you guys like the podcast and you guys want to support, go to my website, RadicalLatino.com. There's a donate button. Just donate to your boy. Supports the cause. Supports the podcast. Also, if you guys don't want to do that, you know, cash at me. Dollar sign, Radical Latino you know and on cash app and all that also i got a twitter and instagram um radical underscore latino underscore both instagram and twitter you know what i'm saying you could just reach me out through there and all that now um i'm bringing you guys something very 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 special you know um truth teacher 2007 i'm gonna just say truth teacher truth teacher you know he he's a one he, you know he's a, he's a cool um like like-minded you know brother uh i i met through youtube you know he's always commenting and stuff to be honest i thought he was a troll account at first but he and you know ended up wasn't you know he, he's a he's a cool down-to-earth dude i didn't know too much about him until we got to know each other and i'm like oh all right cool a lot of people think that you know he he's you know racist or a lot of people don't even like him because of who he associates with listen i'm i'm not i'm not here to find out who he associates with or whatever i want to see what his ideas are you know if his ideas are you know empowerment if his ideas are not i know white supremacist shit that mean you can rock you know what i'm saying that mean you can rock and whoever his associates are you know as long as he's still being empowered you know still with that empowerment shit and he's checking these people and for what he tells me he does you know with me that's all good that's all i need to hear you know what i'm saying that's all i need to hear but this interview was you know was done last week and i had a wonderful time you know having him on and just you know talking about different things because the subject of the basically you know i give him my interview but the subject of our talk is basically anti-blackness in the black community for those who don't know there's this little light skin um channel that basically talks about how light-skinned black people are basically being victimized all over the place and that dark-skinned people are the ones who are the problem in the black community and it's dark-skinned, 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 you know, they go, they go like, they wild out with the shit, you know, and they got some supporters, believe it or not, they got some supporters, which is insane. And it just goes back to the whole anti-blackness thing, which I am, you know, totally against and you should be too because there's no correlations with violence or whatever with skin color that's what white supremacists say you know what i'm saying so that's the reason why i want to do this episode because um from from a black man himself truth teacher you know he's actually coming with some insight and some knowledge which i respect 
But with that being said, I hope you guys enjoy the interview. Yo, welcome back, my people, to another episode of the Radical Latino Show. Now, you guys already know. You guys already know that I always bring out special people, special guests that bring out constructive conversations and constructive things to you guys. You know, I always like to do interviews like this because it not only opens up people's minds up to new ideas and new conversation, but it starts <coughs> conversations, you know? So today I would like to introduce to you guys, Truth Teacher. What's going on, bro? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good, bro. I'm good. I'm, good. I'm glad that, you know, you came to the show. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. yeah. So, How's your coronavirus? Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I keep it, I keep it under control. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? I did a, I interviewed it, you know, since I got it. No, let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. I don't got it by the record. I don't got, actually, I don't even know if I have it. I haven't even gotten tested yet. So hopefully I don't have it. You know what I'm saying? But you know, uh, Let's keep it that way. You know what I'm saying? Before I start seeing a fucking big ass bat wing trying to grow up my ass and shit, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, so truth teacher, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Well, let's see. I am a former history teacher. I was, uh, okay. Let me go in chronological order. I am a first generation American. Um, both of my parents are Jamaican. I was born in New York City, lived in Soundview for the first few years of my life, and then I moved down to Jamaica <clears throat> when I was about four. Um, I grew up down there. I came back in 1976, and at that point, I was living on the Grand Concourse. Um, <clears throat> Between, I'm not going to say exactly well, exactly where, but let's just say between Mount Eden and 170th Street. So for the, all of the old that know the Bronx, you kind of get the general idea of the area. Yeah, I know. Um, I, know. I was a history teacher. I went to school, became a history teacher, and I started working in the Bronx. And um, I got out of school teaching. In about 2005, for various reasons, and um, recently went back to school for a new career, and uh, here we are. And I have my YouTube channel. Um, what is my YouTube channel about? Uh, basically, when I first started it, I still had the uh, the teacher bug, you know, and I came across this um, issue about, you know, the ancient Egyptian race controversy. And um, since I've been traveling to Egypt for a long, long time, I'm really familiar with the culture and the country and the history. So I thought I could offer some insight onto that. Since then, my channel has really grown into a place where I'm trying to uplift people of the African diaspora. So I haven't been very active in terms of putting out videos. Um, I spend a lot of time making comments on other people's videos because it's just a lot quicker and easier. But I have, um, I would say right now, the best part about my channel is really my playlist. So I have a your, lot your of... playlist? What do you mean? My playlist. You know, you have like a list of different videos. You put them in different categories. Oh, it, like, is it like a public play playlist that people could um, check out? Yeah. Okay. So I've got playlists. Um, I've got playlists dealing with natural hair. I've got playlists dealing with um, different aspects of African um, history. Um, different things showing achievements within the African American community or people in the African diaspora and Africa in general. Um, I have, uh, let's see, a playlist dedicated to African spirituality. So there's a lot of good things that I have there. Basically, 
dedicated to uplifting the image of people of the African diaspora. I have um, also playlists dealing, you know, showing the cultural connections between different aspects of um, cultures here in the Caribbean, in North America, and, you know, Africa, you know, like showing direct connections, you know, where these things came from. Since uh, we have a lot of people, as you know, coming up with these revisionist historical ideas about who we are, you know, it's yeah, it's insane. A lot of misinformation and commun- you know, confusion out yeah. there. So it's insane. For the one talking about we're not really from Africa, yada yada yada. I have that playlist to show you know, like uh, no, we're from Africa, and these are the. The things that we have in our different cultures that can be traced directly back to Africa. So there's no confusion and no doubt. It's straight up legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the funny thing is that um, when I found out that you grew up in the Bronx back in them days, like the 70s, and and uh, yep. was it was it the late 60s, early 70s? Well, I was born in the late 60s i was born in 67 got it got it, got it. and yeah so you grew I was up, born in 67 yeah so you grew up in the bronx like around like what late 70s early 80s um well i came back hmm okay so i spent my first few four years in soundview um on i used to live on wheeler avenue like where wheeler avenue ends um, and at that time, there were just like a few building complexes up, and then it was just like wild land over there. You used to go like you know watch the rabbits running around, and yeah, then but but what on what the year, other side but, but there what, was the Bustelo factory. But what year? But what year did you basically grow up? Like, give me a okay, timeline. Okay, so I left. I want to say I must have left like 1970, 1971, and then I came back in 1976. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. So from 1976 to 1992, I was on the concourse. Gotcha. Okay, okay, okay. That's what I wanted to hear. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. um, so I know this is gonna be like a small tangent. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna be a very small mm-hmm. tangent. But, um, did you experience the whole Bronx burning, um, thing, like phenomenon that was happening back in them days? Well. <clears throat> Where I was, well, yes and no. Um, the majority of that stuff was happening in the South Bronx, you know? <clears throat> yeah. But in my neighborhood, um, yeah, there were a lot of buildings that were abandoned. You know, um, I guess it started a little bit before I got there in 70. Well, but then again, you know, yeah. I guess I did because there were areas that I remember the buildings being intact. And then um, by the early 80s, there were entire neighborhoods, like entire blocks that were just like bombed out. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. They were like left in rubble and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And, a lot yeah. Of the- and then they came back and they started, you know, renovating them. But like when I was growing up for those first few years, yeah, they were entire stretches that were completely burnt out you know yeah. like all the buildings on both sides were completely burnt out for yeah, blocks and because, blocks um, and blocks because um they um was it the landlords or something like that wanted um the insurance and it was a whole thing with yeah. the landlords and the whole thing with all of, it was a whole conspiracy or whatever but back in them days they were like saying that well the reason why these uh, places are burning down is because of Heroin addicts, which didn't make any sense. Nah, bullshit. You know what I'm bullshit. saying? Bullshit. What was happening? What was happening is that a couple of things. Now that area, the Bronx in general used to be <clears throat> a largely Jewish area, right? And so, with the new generation of kids that grew up, you know, they started moving out of the Bronx. They started moving to different places. <clears throat> So as they moved out, you know, other people started moving in, more people of color started moving in. 
And then what really made things bad is that the banks pulled out of all of these neighborhoods. So if you were a landlord and you had a building and now you wanted to get a loan to do like maintenance and repairs and stuff, you couldn't get a loan. So for them, they figured, okay, so what's the solution? Because we're losing money here. Oh, you know, let's burn the buildings and collect the insurance. So that's what happened. Yeah, then multiple landlords you know? started to do that, you know? And yeah, it's great. it and, was a thing. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but is that the reason why there's a street named Burnside in the Bronx? <laughs> no, nah, nah, Burnside has always been Burnside. Really? I, I, I think somebody, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe maybe I got it confused, but I, re, I remember somebody <laughs> telling me that, or maybe it was a dope head, I don't know. But they were like, they were like, papi, papi, mira, papi, do, do, you want to know something? Here's some history of the Bronx, papi. You know what I mean? Like, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. It's, no, that's a coincidence. Yeah, maybe, maybe it what was one of those, like, dope, <laughs> dope head, uh, dope head stories. You know what I mean? They used to call no, me no, crazy. No. They used to call me crazy legs, papi. I was really good with breakdancing, you know? You know what I'm saying? So probably, probably. <laughs> Probably, probably was yeah, like that. Burnside but, uh, has always been that. That was that's the original name of you know. Oh, okay. Okay. Of of the street, you know. Yeah. All right. Cool. But cool, um, cool, the cool, Grand cool. Concourse, yeah, the Grand Concourse back in the day, man, that was like the the Park Avenue of the Bronx, you know. Well, yeah, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I think me and you spoke about this. Like, the Grand Concourse is kind of like modeled after the the French uh street in France, yeah, the right? Champs Elysees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it was modeled by it and stuff. So, um, and, so, yeah. so, um, now since you know you're another Bronx site, you know BX all day. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, the 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 thing the thing is, uh, I want to I want to get a little bit more deep into your you know to your history, and then we're going to go into the topic at hand. You know? Yeah. So, um, you said that you were a teacher of history. What made you What made you become a teacher? Uh, in the first place, you know, because <laughs> I know if it was me, that's the last, that's the last job I'll probably think about ever, you know, getting because listen, I was like a class clown in, in school. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, yeah, I probably thought you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, like I was a class clown. And the funny thing is like, I used to hang out with the bad kids, like in the back of the class. That'd be like, yo, suck my dick, teacher. You know what I'm saying? Fuck you. You know what I'm saying? So I would be hanging out hey, with your them. real name wouldn't happen to be Johnny by any chance, would it? Uh, nah, nah, Samuel. My <laughs> real name is Samuel Rodriguez, bro. <laughs> oh, okay, because if it was, I'd probably have to come down. i probably have to meet you up by the Joker set, man. <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> nah. Wait a minute. Are you... Wait, you're the one that... Wait, you... No, 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 trust me, no. But, uh, no, I was always a class clown and all that, but you <laughs> you decided to become a teacher and go back to the Bronx yeah. and, and, and teach. Like, what... Mm -hmm. what what made you? Are, are you? Are you? Do you like you wanted to die or something? Like what? What happened? Like why? Why you choose to do that? Afraid to die, man. Look, I'm not afraid of none of them kids. But you know, the thing about it was, <clears throat> I grew up in the Bronx. I was always, you know, in the top classes. But regardless of the fact, you know, I, I got a shitty education. I was not prepared properly to deal with the pressures of life. I mean, just growing up in that time, in that area, there was a lot of psychological and emotional issues that you had to deal with, you know? And the one thing that I wish that I had had was somebody who could have like explained what life was all about, you know? And so I wanted to give back to, you know, kids so that they didn't have to go through the crap that I went through emotionally. And I was going to use history as the medium because quite honestly, I think the job of history is exactly that. So it's not about sitting down and memorizing names and dates, but it's about learning life lessons. You know, that's what you should be looking at when you look at history. You should be learning life lessons, you know, learning the good things, what to do to make your life better, and the things that you need to avoid, the mistakes that you don't want to repeat. And so I decided that I was going to be a history teacher. And um, 
<clears throat> didn't really realize that I was not prepared for this. Um, did I have hard time with the kids? Um, to a certain extent, I realized that junior high school was not my medium. Um, because I was going to kill somebody. I mean, I knew that I, Listen, my, my I days imagine, in junior bro. high. I could imagine. Listen, I knew my time in junior high. It was time for me to leave. Yeah. When Jose told me to suck his nuts. Yeah, oh, that wasn't, and... that wasn't me. That was my boy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jose told me in class one day to suck his nuts. And my response was you got a rubber neck why don't you suck them yourself uh oh <laughs> oh the principal calls me into the office and says you know i don't think you're really cut out <clears throat> to teach here and i said you know funny you should say that because i was thinking the same thing myself yeah, you know as a matter yeah, of fact yeah. i already started looking like um junior high them kids was like no listen and this was and this was in the I Bronx, right? I was gonna right? kill somebody, cause huh? This was in the Bronx, right? This was in the Bronx. This is after I got my license back because my first gig teaching, I got my license taken away illegally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they accused me of beating kids up in the classroom. Well, you better stop doing and that. And the principal. Well, hey, man, you know, <laughs> they're just right at that height, you know. <laughs> they low to the ground, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. so but the principal, they wanted to get rid of me because I was drawing attention to the fact that his top class was illiterate. And, you know, dumbass me, I figure, you know, I'm a teacher. We're teachers. We're here to teach so the kids can't read. We need to teach him how to read. Wait, didn't you get the memo, bro? Is the school to prison pipeline? You're not supposed <laughs> to teach him to read. You gotta get them prepared for prison, bro. Man, listen, I was not. I didn't know these people worship the devil in the basement. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yo, they had like I black robes on. on. They value. have black. They have black robes on. Part of the Illuminati. Somebody had a goat head. And all that. You're like, what the fuck is all this? Somebody hanging upside down uh -huh. on the upside down cross the uh -huh. whole nine. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, he, you know, I came from it. Okay, you know, we need to do something to address this. The way he saw it was, okay, I got a problem. I got to get rid of this one. And so basically I had to break up a fight. <clears throat> the kids all got together and concocted a story that I... I beat him up and everything. So he calls me in the office the next day, says, okay, what happened? And I told him what happened. He goes to me, okay, this is what I think happened. I think you did it, but you don't remember because you blacked out. And to be quite honest, I'm, I'm really, I'm really afraid for these children. But guess where I was five minutes later? I was back in the same class with the kids that supposedly I fucked up. Wow. So now, wow. for anybody out there in the educational system, you know that when there's an allegation of corporal punishment or misconduct or whatever, the teacher is supposed to be immediately removed from the classroom and they have to report downtown to what we call the rubber room, you know, until you have a hearing and then they decide if you're guilty or innocent. So... <clears throat> We kept going and going and going, but they had to keep stalling because here's the thing. If you have a teacher who's so crazy that they black out and beat up kids, the judge is going to ask you like, and you sent him back to those same kids the next day. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you it, know it what I'm saying? Up. It's it wouldn't like, add up. Yeah. Does that add up? No. Nah, and nah, so they no. knew that it didn't make no sense. So they kept stalling and stalling and stalling until the summer vacation. And then next thing I know, you know, they said, okay, we're going to pick up again in September. And in July, I got a letter in the mail saying that my license has been suspended. And I'm like, but we didn't have a hearing yet. And yeah. nobody would touch it. Nobody in the Board of Education would touch it. Yeah. Nobody in the UFC would touch it. So I was out of work for like almost two years. Jeez. And I got my license back because I had a friend who was a lawyer 
And she asked me, yo, what's going on with this? And I told her, she said, that's some bullshit. And she said, you know what? Let me write a letter. She wrote a letter and they saw a letter from a lawyer. All of a sudden, I got my license back. Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> that was what a coincidence, right? What a coincidence. What a coinky thing. What a coincidence. But yeah. but I'm I'm glad, you know, st stuff like that, you know, worked <laughs> out for you and stuff. Um, Now, something mm -hmm. else that um we've talked privately, but you also said in the live stream that I had one day and then you and um my boy Hercules, you know, you guys were like, you know, uh, talking about it, discussing it, you know, um, very yeah. respectful, which, you know, I always condone, you know, if you disagree with somebody, have a respectful conversation, you know, um, mm -hmm. so you don't identify as black. Can you explain that? You know, can you explain that for, for Yeah, for and people? now I have to explain that really well because when people hear someone say that, they have a knee-jerk reaction that, oh, this is somebody who's ashamed of their heritage. They think they're better than somebody. They're trying to distance themselves. And to be perfectly honest with you, people do have a right to have that feeling, that idea, because it is something that has historically happened for a long time. That is real. There are a lot of people who are ashamed of their heritage and their background, or they feel some sense of superiority, or they want to distance themselves. But for me, that's not the case. Um, the reason why I don't identify as Black is because, first of all, this idea of racial classification was not created by people of African descent or people of any descent outside of Europe. Okay? Preach, preach, this brother. Was, preach. Teach these devils. Something... Teach these devils. <laughs> this is something that was created specifically by the European colonialists in order to justify the oppression of the people that they placed on the bottom of society here. You know, this was created to maintain a class structure. Okay. You go to Africa, nobody was identifying as Negro. That is not a concept that comes from anywhere in Africa. Nobody was calling themselves black. There is no yeah. Blackistan. That's true. That's in, true. in, Africa. There's no Negro land. They were they were, so ident they were that, identifying with a nation, right? With with nations like they, where they identify come from? with their nation, with their family group, with their ethnic group, whatever. But that's what it is. You know, whatever kingdom they belong to, that's what they identify with. And that's the same for people all over the world. You know, Africa is not a country. It's a continent. And it's made up of many, many different types of people. It's not all the same. And nobody's looking at each other. Oh, I'm black, you black. Oh, let's all sing Kumbaya. Yeah. Bullshit. Now, now some, you people, know, like, some people might be listening to this and be like, all right, cool, bro. Cool, to, a truth teacher. That's what's up. But what do you identify as? So what, what do you tell those type of people? Well, um, from a genetic point of view, I'm a a mixed person. I'm of uh, predominantly African descent. And my next big chunk after that is European with a little sprinkling of North African, a little sprinkling of Middle Eastern. There's a little, 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 little bit of um, indigenous, you know, Taino in there too. Um, so it's like truth in labeling, you know, that's the way I look at it. I'm not a full blooded African. So, um, I don't try to pass myself off or pretend that I am because I mean, like I'm one of these people that, you know, you look at me, you can tell, you know, like there's something else going on in there. So I'm just honest about it. And, um, I don't have any qualms about that. I don't think I need to. So I identify as a mixed person of predominantly African descent. Gotcha. And, um, gotcha. you know, I used to identify as black, but when I understood, well, two things happened. First of all, when I would travel outside of the United States, 
and I tell people that I was black, they would look at me like I was crazy because for them being black, it wasn't a concept of race as much as it was an adjective. You know, to be black means that, you know, you were dark brown and, you know, you had dark brown skin. And I don't have dark brown skin. So they're like, um, it's like, you know, it's like saying those black white shoes over there. Yeah, yeah You know, yeah. that shit don't make no sense. You know, so people would look at me and they're like, I don't understand. What do you mean? You're, you're not black. And this whole one drop rule. And this is when I realized that the way Americans see race is not shared all over the world because, you know, they would ask me like, you know, I, I have friends and, you know, one, one person is black and, you know, the wife is white or whatever. So why is it that the child is still considered black when one of the parents isn't black? Like, why do they consider, still consider the child black? when they're only half black, you know, like yeah, they didn't understand. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, people are getting confused, you know, because like when I went to Egypt, everybody thought I was Egyptian, you know, and yeah. um, they never heard of Jamaica <laughs> at that time. They're like, where? I say Jamaica, they say uh, Cuba I said, um, no, but you close. And they say uh, Africa. I said, mm, well, I knew once upon a time, yeah, you know, yeah. like real far away, just, bro. Got it. You real, real cold, they never, real cold. Oh, yeah. Cuba, Cuba, you're getting warmer. You're getting warmer. So you're getting warmer. You're getting warmer. But they thought Cuba was in Africa. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So they never at that time, nobody knew what the fuck I was talking about. Yeah. And they would get mad at me. They would get mad at me because they thought that I was. Egyptian, but I went to the States and now I'm coming back with my ass on my shoulders. And if I didn't speak to them in Arabic, they would get really insulted, you know? So I yeah. was like, okay, people don't understand this shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I and, get people arguing the thing, me. The thing is that I understand where you're coming from because, you know, I, I've been saying yeah. this whole thing, you know, since the beginning that, you know, this whole concept of race is a made up thing. But since we live in the United States, <laughs> In a system of white supremacy, we have to fall in line with it. You know, we just got to play ball. So I go based on what the white supremacists have put down since the one drop rule and every other thing. I identify as black and native. You know what I'm saying? Because and of I'm the kind of person that will tell the white supremacists to go fuck themselves. Yeah. I don't care what you think. Yeah, you say you, know, all, you look, say all, I mean, you say all day, you say all that, and then they're gonna be like, "Yeah, we'll we'll let you know exactly what you identify as." They'll well, get that. They'll they, get that. They, they'll get well, that piece of paper. What they and think. They get they get that piece of paper and check out black in a box, and they'll be like, "All right, next." Well, let's let's be honest. What they think I am, they think I'm a nigger. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, whatever yeah, I yeah. think of myself, but that's what they think I am. They're just gonna be polite and call me. Negro or Negroid yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Really, what they think of me, they think I'm a nigga. Now, do I have to agree with them? No, I don't. So, you know, especially when people were getting confused, you know, because my phenotype wasn't matching up to their stereotypical image of what a black person. I said, you know what? Okay, I'm a person of African descent. My ancestors came from Africa, so. You can't argue me down about that. Yeah. My ancestors yeah, came yeah, from yeah. a very specific now, area. Now, that don't mean I have to look like anything in particular. It's yeah. like that's where my ancestors came from. Now, I now, can look like anything. Let me let me let me ask you. Some some people might hear this, right, and say, "Yo, you know what? He's he's right. He's right." But I feel some type of way that he still doesn't identify as black. They might ca start calling you a coon and all that. What what do you say about people uh, about that? Uh, well, <clears throat> listen, we have to understand that we're talking about a system of oppression here that has a very strong psychological component to it, right? Yeah, yeah. And people have to choose the way that works best for them to fight the system. 
So I know people who they choose to embrace the classification and to, you know, use it against the oppression. It's like, okay, you try to kill me with a sword, but I'm going to grab the sword out of your hand and I'm going to chop your head off with it. That's the way they choose to fight. I choose to fight in a different way. I don't think it's really important how a person chooses to identify, you know, themselves. As long as you remember at the end of the day, we're still part of a family. So call yourself whatever the fuck you want to call yourself. I don't really give a damn. Call yourself peanut butter and jelly if that makes you happy. But don't forget that we're family. So at the end of the day, that's what matters to me is that we recognize that we are people of the African diaspora. We That doesn't mean that you have to be pure. You could be pure-blooded. You could be mixed. You could be whatever. If you are a descendant of the African diaspora and you honor that part of your ancestry, well, even if you don't, we're still biologically related. But from an emotional and spiritual standpoint, who do I feel connected with? Those people who identify that heritage that have yeah. that lineage now now uh, you know so if you identify as black guess what we're kinfolk yeah you yeah. identify as biracial we're kinfolk you identify as mixed we're kinfolk yeah. now yeah i don't i don't like you not saying black bro i don't like that no let me stop um <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 i'm just playing um now let me let me so me and you've been like i said been talking like you know off off the air and you said something mm-hmm. very interesting that I I found very interesting. You know, um, yeah. what was it? You uh you said that um that you practice a African spiritual spirituality, a system yeah. of African spirituality. Would you mind ex- um mm-hmm. explaining that? Yeah. So my spiritual tradition is um what people call Santeria. Uh, We don't call ourselves that per se. This is something that the outsiders called us. Um, This is a spiritual philosophy that came from the Yoruba people in uh, Nigeria. It was brought to Cuba. There's also branches of it in in Brazil. Haiti. You also find it. um, Well, Haiti is, uh, for the most part, they're not. Yoruba based, they're from a very closely related ethnic group. They're coming more out of Benin and Dahomey, you know, but it, it's very similar, but there are very big differences as well. Um, but um, the system that we have in Cuba, it's called Lukumi. That's what we call it, yeah, Lukumi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, like I said, it's coming from the Yoruba people. Um, I got involved with it very young. When I came back to the United States, um, my mother had been involved with it. So when I came back to the United States, before I could come to New York, we had to stop off in Miami first, um, because her godparents, they had moved to Miami. So I got my, um, the first stage of initiation into following the tradition is you get your um, necklaces and each necklace is dedicated to a different um, deity. Uh, deity. Not Well, not God. I mean, the thing about it is um, there is no real word in English that encompasses the concept of what they are. In the religion in Yoruba, we call them Orisha. Okay. And um, but y- there is no real word in English or Spanish that really describes what they are. The closest they can get is gods, but in our tradition, there's only one um, entity that is a god that is God. You know, the creator of everything. Like there's only one. Like godlike, right? Yeah, I mean, there's only there's only one entity that is 
God. You know, there's only one God, you know, the the source that everything originated from, only one. And yeah, everything yeah. else is creation. So Orisha are not God. Um, what about the Spanish? What about the Spanish word for Santos? Santos. Well, okay. So here's the thing: when we came over from Nigeria, of course, everybody was forced to adopt Christianity, you know, Catholicism. And so, what we noticed was that they had in the Catholic Church they had different things. And a lot of these saints had attributes that were similar to the Orishas that we had in Nigeria. So, for example, um, the best uh, known is um, Shango. Shango is the <clears throat> deity that rules over, I mean, many things, but, you know, superficially thunder, lightning. Shango's colors are um, red and white. Shango is a warrior. He carries a, a double axe. And so they saw Santa Barbara, and her colors are red and white. And her story talks about her being imprisoned in a tower and um, the tower being destroyed by lightning. So we're like, oh, Shango. So we would pretend to be praying to Santa Barbara but we were really working with the energy of Shango. And so we did that for all of the different Orishas, you know? We yeah. saw the, uh, the saints that had the same attributes as the Orisha, and we pretended to worship them. So that's how we got the term, you know, Santeros, because they looked at, oh, they're so devoted to the saints. Nah, motherfuckers. <laughs> like, we over here doing our own thing, you know, but we're just pretending for y'all. So um, that system developed in Cuba. Now, there were a lot of things that had to be changed because the circumstances in Cuba were different than what they were in Nigeria. So, for example, if we were in Nigeria... When it comes to the um, the collares or the necklaces or what we call them in the religion, um, ilekes, um, you would only have one ileke for the orisha for the particular town that you live in. But over here in Cuba, when you get initiated to a house, you get five different um orishas that you know you're given their uh, their necklaces and part of the reason for that is that we did it so that the knowledge of working the mysteries of those orishas would not be forgotten and also i think because you know the circumstances that we were under over here you know we needed more protection you know because these motherfuckers were crazy you know and we needed more t protection to to keep ourselves well. So we got all those different things, you know. Um, certain things we had to substitute. So, for example, like um, we do have uh, traditions of divination in our religion. Um, we used to, well, back in Africa, they would use the kola nut. And it's based on a binary system of ones and zeros. So when you throw the cola nuts, you know, the way it lands, it'll either correspond to a one or to a zero, you know, and that like, will uh, give you... Like bi binary? Like the computer language? Yeah. So it's very similar to if anybody knows anything about I Ching, you know, the Chinese system, I Ching. It's very similar no, to don't, that. I don't know nothing. No, I don't, I don't know it, but... Okay, so we have um, sacred verses called Odu. You know, like, um, it's an oral tradition. So instead of having written scriptures, we have oral traditions. I guess you would say it's the equivalent of scripture. Each Odu deals with a different aspect of life. And not only does it deal with the circumstances of life, but if there's a problem, it also contains the solution to the problem. 
So, for example, let's say you throw the cola nuts and the numbers that you correspond come out to be like 11. That would correspond to a particular Odu that would speak to your life situation and tell you what you need to do to find balance. But in Cuba, there is no cola nuts. So what we substituted for that was coconut. You have one side is black, one side is white. And you take um, four of them, the priest will throw it, depending on how they land, you know, those, uh, those patterns correspond to different numbers, you know, and that will tell you the answer to the question that you're working with, you know, like a yes or no yeah. like question, I, I, I you know. I remember um, going to the botanicas and, and all that, and yeah. they would have candles, so let's say if... Mm -hmm. if like somebody you know is pregnant or whatever the case is, you get like a pregnancy candle. You know what I'm saying? Or if they want it to be a boy or girl, you'll get the boy or girl candle. You know what I mean? Like botanicas. Yeah, no, here, well, here's the thing with botanicas. Botanicas don't necessarily represent any one tradition in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they're like a one-stop shop, you know, for everybody and anybody. So... You know, there's a lot of different traditions that came over from Africa. There's a lot of things that were developed here. There's spiritual traditions here, like Epiritismo, which is based on um, heavily Catholic influence, but with a little influence from, you know, different African traditions. So um, we don't, in our tradition we don't have candles to determine the sex of your child you know like the whole philosophy is very different it's like you're given yeah. your destiny or your job when you're coming to earth like you come to earth for a purpose how, so, about, how about we combine the two get a candle and a coconut what that, <laughs> over. No. No, no. Um, but yeah i mean like that would go against you know our basic philosophy yeah, because yeah, yeah. if you're coming from the the realm of, you know, the non-physical with a purpose coming here. It's already determined that, you know, to fulfill your destiny, you have to be a man or a woman, you know, so somebody working with a candle to try to change that, it's like, nah, you, you're stepping out of your lane, you know? The yeah, soul yeah, is yeah, already yeah. coming here with a predetermined purpose, you yeah, know? Yeah, that's a fact. Now, But there's other traditions that, you know, they yeah. do other things. And so a botanica is there to serve everybody, whatever you're into, you know, they got something for they, you. Yeah, they got frog legs, bat ears, you know, cat yeah, tongue. I don't know nothing. You know what I mean? I don't no, know no, nothing no. about no bat ears. <laughs> no, let me stop. They got corona legs, <laughs> all that. Um, <laughs> no, so um, what was it? Uh so me and you we're, we're talking about the same thing that we we're talking about now, right? And I made a cor yeah. I made a correlation because I grew up, you know, Pentecostal, right? My mom was super mm -hmm. su super that is super point. <laughs> yeah, uh, like I was, my mom was super religious, right? And I grew up mm -hmm. in Bente uh, you know, being Pentecostal, I went to black churches, I even went to Latin churches. I even went to a, a white church and it was extremely yeah. different from the black and Latin churches because they weren't, you know, singing or every all that. Everybody was like so boring or whatever. So anyway, I digress. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, when I go to the black and Latin churches, right, I would always see the same yeah. thing. They will pray until the point where they'll catch the Holy Spirit and they start flipping mm -hmm. and dancing and speaking in tongues and doing three cartwheels and all that. Mind you, they were all in the wheelchair, right? And they're doing all yeah. of this. They're doing all of this and stuff. And not only one person, but another person, another person, another person gets that spirituality. So when I was researching mm -hmm. about Santeria, Voodoo, and all that, I ended up finding out that it's a spiritual class system. And when I'm seeing videos on the people meditating or just praying, they will act the same way. And mind you, yeah. um, Santeria, Voodoo, and all these African spiritual systems are is something that was already here way before Christianity, yeah. Pentecostalism, or whatever, right? So, yep. in, before Islam, Judaism, yeah, so, all of that, it was so, already so, there in Africa. Yeah, so yeah. let me let me ask you something. Do you think mm -hmm. this is just me, just just me, just asking a question? 
I'm trying to con yeah. connect it. Do you think that when these people are actually praying to, you know, to, to what they think is God or whatever, they're mm -hmm. actually tapping into a spiritual system that they're misunderstanding as to being God when in reality it's something else? Well, let me put it to you this way. Um, there is only one God. However you choose to connect with that, that you know, energy source is up to you. Um, now, as to are they tapping into the Holy Spirit, um, they might be tapping into ancestral spirits, you know, who are trying to communicate with them. They might be just expressing their own um, emotional release, you know, like a catharsis. Um, some of them are faking the funk. You know, so the quest, you know, the answer to wait, that question wait, you mean is to tell me, only you wait, above. you mean to tell me that lady in the wheelchair with two fake legs got mm -hmm. up, started doing cartwheels because she was faking? Are you? Nah, I don't believe that shit. Nah, nah, get the fuck out of here with that. You might have been like nah. connecting with ancestral spirits. Wait, wait, so but you there mean, are people that are faking the funk. Are you mean to tell me when the pastor threw his hand like a fucking Hadouken, you know? And 11, 11 people just went down in the floor. They were all faking? Nah, bro. Now get out of here with that. Nah, I don't believe that. A lot of them. Yo, listen, listen. You know, at, some, at a certain point, my mom became Pentecostal as well. So we converted to Pentecostalism. We got rid of our gureros, our, our collares, and all of that. We wasn't messing with that Orisha business no more. We were Pentecostal. We ended up going to this one church and the priest, the, the preacher got the revelation from God that all of this getting slayed in the spirit stuff was not of God. It wasn't biblical anymore. And all of a sudden, just like that, from one week to the next, nobody was falling out anymore. <laughs> you know? Wow. You know, but, but, nobody but bro, was falling out anymore because. But bro, let me play devil's advocate for a second. Revelation. Let me play devil's advocate for a second, bro. I've seen yeah. some preachers grab a snake, a poisonous snake, but and they get mm -hmm. bitten in the arm. They're bleeding and they don't die, bro. Explain that, huh? Explain that. <laughs> <laughs> and did you miss the ones where the preachers got bit by nah, the nah, snake nah, and nah, they nah, did nah, die? No, 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 no. That's a straw man <laughs> argument. Don't worry about that one. No, 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 no. Those, those are. I, um, God didn't know what to do with that one. <laughs> God didn't. Don't worry about that. No, 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 well, don't worry about know, that. There's, there's people who have um, like people who handle snakes. You know, like zookeepers and stuff. Some of them have developed immunity to the poisons. Um. You know, each person's biochemistry is a little bit different, you know? So there are people, you know, like I said, um, zookeepers who handle these reptiles. Occasionally they get bitten. Maybe they don't get a full dose of the poison. And um, their body develops an immunity to it. So I would imagine that there's certain people... The only you know, one certain, in true, these people, the only one in true zookeeper here is God, yo. He's the one protecting. <laughs> the, no, let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. No, yeah, I, but I don't people scare the shit out of me. That's like nah, some yeah, serpent yeah. in the rainbow kind of shit. Yeah, <laughs> no, because uh, we all fuck with that. The, the, when I started to get out of the church, that's when I started because I started to researching everything. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is all this is all bullshit. You know, um, so before we mm -hmm. get into the topic uh, topic at hand, let me just uh, ask, you know, one question. Um, yeah. What uh, the, the main one? Um, truth. Where did you get the name truth teacher? You know what I'm saying? I know you were a teacher, but what the what the truth is, you know what I'm saying? Why truth teacher? Because if anybody would just, you know, hear that, you know, truth teacher, I'm like, oh, shit, this dude is some whole tip. Moorish Science <laughs> Temple with the Ankh and the and, and all that, you know. So so where? Oh, where did, y'all got that hidden knowledge that the white man don't want you to know. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> message, message. So so, 
where did the name Truth Teacher come from? Because I'm I'm telling you that shit hard. If you a rap, what? If you yo, if you go to Harlem right now and you on the corner, mm -hmm. son, yo, all your DVDs will sell, yo. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the wrong gig, damn. No, no. So yo, you want to know the truth about that? Like yeah, yeah, for go real? Ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, it's so fucking lame. I just couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> For real, it's like, okay, so I made my first video on my channel was dealing with that whole Egyptian race controversy. And I was looking at all the comments from all these different people. And, it, you know, it was like, okay, so there's a lot of people here. They just don't understand the culture. They don't understand the history. So I'm a teacher. I'm going to tell them the truth about it. So I was like, okay, so what should I call my channel? I was like, uh, truth teacher? I don't know. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> so that's what it was. Gotcha. That's gotcha, how I gotcha. came up. That's how it was, man. It's gotcha. like nothing gotcha. really too deep. <laughs> I've been gotcha. trying to change it for years. I just can't think nah, of nah, nah. Leave something it. else to call trust myself. Me. Trust me, leave it, bro. Leave it. Um, I think I think you should go the whole tep route. Truth be told, oh god, you no, should go. The yeah, don't like me. <laughs> nah, you should go the whole tep route, bro. You should go the whole oh, tep route. Lord. Drink, uh, you know, all that kundalini, yeah. all that kundalini energy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, dr <laughs> drinking, drink some alkaline water, bro. Come on, you should do. You should do it, bro. Yo, I make, I make alkaline water, man, with like see, uh, see, with you're lemon. Yo, you are already there, bro. You see, you, <laughs> oh, you're missing a calling, man. You are missing a calling now. Now let's get to the topic at hand. So I got truth. Yeah. I got truth teacher. You know the the woke hotep. You know. No, nah, let me stop. I got truth teacher here, right? Because I don't think I would have done a great service. I'll do a great disservice if I didn't have somebody that actually knows more about it and that's in the community. You know, um, than than me. You know. So the topic at hand basically is anti-blackness in the black community. So this is something yeah. that I've been actually, I've seen before, but I've never really focused too much on it. I've seen it mm -hmm. here and there. And we, I want to go deep today. Okay. I want to go yeah. deep. I want to really focus on anti-blackness in the black community, because I know there's different layers to this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's different layers. So um, I want you to start it off. Well, you know, the thing about it is that it goes much deeper than the quote unquote black community. Basically, anywhere where there has been a history of African slavery and colonialism, you will find anti black. And I, I guess we need to clarify what we mean by black here. Um, well, what do we mean by black? Let's clarify that first of all. Okay. Uh, how would you? How would we define? Which definition are we uh, using? Pe uh, people from African descent. Okay, so are we including North Africans in this, or people just like the Af darker skinned people Africans from African descent? Yes, everybody that's included that experience uh, slavery that are that they could trace their ancestry back to African descent. Yes. Okay, so we're talking the more melanated Africans versus the not so melanated North Africans. Melanated African, if you're to me, if you're African, you know, and you come from African descent, then yes, this is including you. Okay, so we're talking about our more melanated African people who have experienced slavery. So, yes, yeah. anywhere where there has been that history, you're going to find people who have anti-black sentiment. Or if you want to think about it, another way to look at it, um, what you talk about on your channel a lot, white supremacy. We need to understand that this sentiment is a virus of the mind, right? Yeah white supremacy, racism, et cetera, et cetera. These are all viruses of the mind. And if we look at it that way, then it becomes obvious that anyone can catch a virus. 
So you don't have to be white to be a white supremacist. If white supremacy is a mind virus. So yeah, if yeah. you are living in an environment where that virus is running rampant, you run the risk of becoming infected. And I would dare say that most of us are infected with the virus. It's just a gotcha. matter of how deeply affected we are. Some of us might have mild symptoms. Some of us may be asymptomatic. Some of us are, you know, really sick. Some of us are in critical condition, you know? Gotcha, so gotcha. wherever it has existed, you're going to find, you will find it in the Middle East. You will find it in North Africa. You will find it in South America and Latin and Central America and the Caribbean. And of course, you will find it here in the United States. And even parts of Europe where, you know, African slaves were brought, brought in. So, yeah, there are people, if we're being specific now, we're talking about the African-American community. Yeah. Okay. So within the African-American commu community specifically, yes, there are a lot of people who are infected with the virus. But, you know, they're not unique. It's just that we happen to be living in the United States, and so we're talking about that population. But if we go to the Caribbean, if we go to the rest of Latin America, we will find people who are stick with the virus in the same way, and they show the same symptoms. Because the virus is the virus, and, you know, the symptoms, the, man, the way it manifests, is the way it manifests, like yeah. coronavirus. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know? so, give us some examples of anti-blackness in the black community, because historically, I've I've seen you know things like the brown paper bag test, or like yeah. things like the blue vein society. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. those will be small examples. Can you give us other examples? Well, you know, like what we were talking about before. You know, like this whole thing about. Um, all these people who have these revisionist ideas of our origins. So, you know, you got these people talking about, no, nah, we're not from Africa. We're original Hebrews. We're, we're from Israel. No, nah, we're not from no Africa. We're, um, what is it now? We're, uh, we're the Native Americans. You know, so that's an example. It's like it's a hatred and a disdain of, our origins, our actual origins in Africa, in West Africa. I guess we could even include the Hoteps in this because they really, a lot, well, I'm not going to say all of them because, of course, you're going to have, oh, well, that ain't me. Well, then if that ain't you, I ain't talking about you. But there are a lot of people who, who will argue you down and tell you our people didn't come from West Africa. They came from Egypt. The real Egyptians, they migrated to West Africa, and then we ended up in slavery or whatever. So it's like they try everything that they can to distance themselves from their actual origins in Central and Western Africa to an imagined origin somewhere else and everywhere else but where they actually come from. That's a manifestation gotcha. of shame. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, because I've seen some, you know, some people even, you know, tear down black women in order yeah. to, in order to justify certain things that they do, you know, either sexually mm -hmm. or other stuff. Is that, would you say that's a, that's a form of anti-blackness? Most definitely, because I mean, come on, We're, there's nothing more sacred than the women in your community. That's the door of life right there. You know, I mean, the woman's womb is the gateway between the dimension of the physical and the non-physical. That's where life comes into this physical dimension. So if you have Damn, nothing you but sounding this real hot up right now, bro. Oh shit. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm tapping in. I'm tapping in. So if you have nothing but this disdain for the gateway of life that you came through, what is that? That's hatred. How can you hate your own women? Yeah, and it's not yeah. to make an, make an excuse for the ratchet women, but you know what? There's ratchet women in every society. That's true. That's absolutely why are true. You using, why are you using the lowest denominator to evaluate to evaluate your entire community. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, I've, I've even I've even um heard some black men say that listen, I like going to Latin America. I like going to, you know, DR South America because there are women out there and they know how to treat a man, basically being submissive. They they have real hair and they don't have the attitude. And to me, I I felt real offended by that because not because they go into Latin America or whatever. The fact that why would you dog out your own women? You know what I'm saying? That's to me, that's crazy. You know what I mean? Like at least come up with if that's, you know, if you want to really go to Latin America or other places to get with women, at least, you know, be some, you know, be truthful about it. Or you're you're like something else, you know what I'm saying? Well, the reason why I like because I like the culture or something, but not be like yo because you know they this the attitude, good hair, yeah, you know what I mean? Listen, the the way I look at it is if these people are so broken that they don't want to be a part of it, let them go, let them go, let them be somebody else's problem. <laughs> Sorry, but you know. For, and I know that there are a lot of women who get, you know, offended by this. Oh, these guys that listen, ladies, you ain't missing nothing because stop and think about it. If you got somebody that's that broken, do you really want them bringing that shit to you? Do you really want to deal with that on a daily basis? So sometimes, you know, you got to thank God for hidden blessings. You know, you're dodging a bullet. They don't want. Hopefully they just don't reproduce, <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 and yeah, we can yeah, start yeah, afresh yeah. with a new generation. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, I've been hearing this stuff for like over 30 years, you know, before there was YouTube and the Internet. Um, there was 2020 and 60 Minutes and, you know, all these shows. And I remember seeing a show talking about men who are going overseas to find love. And it was Nin about these men day complaining fiance? about... That's what huh? it was? 90 Day Fiance? Nah, this is like way... This is like before you were born. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> way back. You know, and they're talking about they need to go to all these different countries to find real women because women here in the United States are so screwed up. And there was one dude, he was a, an African-American guy talking about, you know, he's going to find salvation in Brazil. And I'm thinking to myself, Brazil, like, why? And he's like, you men, you need to come to Brazil because this is where the real women are. They know how to treat men like men. And I just thought, like, that is some whacked out shit. I had no idea that this thing grew into, like, a whole thing. You know, it's taken on a life of its own now. But, you know, yeah. I just never got, you know, I never understood the logic, especially when I started looking into it. And I started seeing the whole sex tourism tip. I mean, even in that documentary, it was obvious to me that a lot of these women were just looking for a green card, you know? Oh, yeah, of course. The majority but, of them are. Yeah, you know, they're looking for a meal ticket. And, you know, when I started looking, like, I, I would say within the past five years, I've started to become aware that this is a thing. And, you know, I started hearing Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic. And I said, well, you know what? Let me get online and go check out, you know, Dominican Republic and see what the hell the big hoopla is all about. And I'm like, okay, so let me see if I got this straight. 
you need to leave the United States because the women here, they're gold diggers. They're, uh, they got bad attitude. They're all whores. And you need to save yourself. You need to go and find real women. So the, the, the answer, you know, the solution to this dilemma is to leave the United States with all these whores and go down to Latin America and wife up a real whore. Like, um, yeah, and, and, okay. And, and this is the thing, like, mind you, you know, I'm half Dominican. I've been to Dominican probably plenty of times. And trust me, mm -hmm. guys, those women over there are not, if you're talking about you're not going to get attitude, you're going to get all, like, attitude times 10 with Dominican women, okay? I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, most Dominican women out there, they they got attitudes out the ass, you know what I mean? But but mind you, this is not all for, uh, like all black people think like this, you know what I'm saying? It's just the, no, the ones, of course the ones, not, and that's know, what we have to do. we have to be very specific yeah, about yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, it's that. just the ones that do, you know. And this is a yeah. form, a form. I do believe this is a form of anti-blackness if you it are is. if you are you know believing that your women are a certain way and that's the main reason why you're going over there. You know what I mean? Um also what also another form of anti blackness, you you could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe is mm -hmm. you know, this whole uh, you know, light skin black people that have these negative attributes to dark skin black people. This is something new that I've even found out myself that I didn't even know existed. Well, well here's the thing. It's new and it's not new. Yeah. You know, like I said, remember, we're talking about a virus of the bind, right? And white supremacy was a strategy that <clears throat> was created by the ruling elite class. It was one of many strategies, okay, that was created by the ruling elite in order to maintain the class structure, all right? So in this strategy, they created a hierarchy, right? And at the top of that hierarchy were pure-blooded Europeans, right? And yeah. then you start yeah. going down yeah. the line. So if you're in a society where the population is mostly people of European descent, and then uh, Native Americans and Africans, well, the closer you are to European, the higher up on, you know, the higher up in the hierarchy you are. So, of course, you started having relations between all of these different people, and you started getting people who were different percentages of mixture between African and European and Native American. And so what happened was that quite often the people who were of more European extraction, or maybe they had a parent, one parent that was European, a lot of times they could end up having more advantages. You know, like the parent might decide to free that child, might decide to educate that child. But now here's the thing that you got to keep in mind. It wasn't a guarantee. For every child that you had that was recognized by their European father who received, you know, their freedom and education, there were dozens more who remained in slavery who were treated no different than any of the other slaves. And I know like one of the things people like to talk about is, oh, well, you know, the mixed kids or the quote unquote mulattoes, they got to work in the house. Um, let's just sit down and think about this logically for a second here, okay? So I know they call it the big house, but how fucking big do you think this goddamn house is? You know, how many people can you fit up in that motherfucker? Right? Yeah, yeah. You know? So the majority of light-skinned people are not going to be squeezed up in that one fucking house, okay? You're going to have some of them that are outside in the fields working alongside everybody else. 
And not everybody that was in the big house was light-skinned. How do I know that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the way I, that I know I, that... I didn't, but okay. <laughs> no, let me say, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Hey, just rock and roll with it, man. <laughs> <laughs> the way that I know this is from my own personal history. My ancestor on my paternal side, who originally came to Jamaica, came to the island in the late 1780s. He was only eight years old. He was a houseboy. He worked in the house. And as he grew older, they taught him how to do different things. You know, they taught him skills, you know. So, I mean, like, listen, he came from Central Africa. He was um, from somewhere near Congo, according to what he, you know, passed down in the uh, the family history. Um, I don't think you get any more blacker than that. That's pretty black, you know? He yeah. wasn't mixed. He wasn't half white or whatever. He was working in the house. Not everybody that worked in the house was light-skinned. Not everybody that worked in the fields was dark skinned. And let's just be perfectly honest. Even if you were working in the big house, um, okay, so maybe you're not out there in the sun uh, getting bloody fingers, picking cotton, or being cut to death with, you know, sugar cane. But what is so fucking fabulous about living in the house with these crazy people? that you can't ever get away from. At least if you're working in the fields, you know, when the day is over, you get to go home. If you're a house slave, you don't never get to go home. It's like you working with your crazy boss 24-7. You yeah. never get to escape. Yeah. And, and, the and that's why a lot of the slaves who actually did run away, a lot of them were house slaves. Yeah, they, they, they were. So how yeah. fucking fabulous was that? <laughs> you yeah. know? If yeah. it was so fucking fabulous, why are you running? Where are you going? Yeah, so you know, not but but this is also also the thing, um, because I've seen some of these light skinned black people talk about, uh, there's no such thing as light skin privilege, and the thing is that they well, they fail they fail to comprehend whenever people do say there is some light skin privilege, is you know coming from the dominant society, not coming from the black community that that's what we're referring to. And we're never referring to yeah. the privilege as 100%. We're talking about a fraction of a no. fraction, you know? Well, let's, let's, let's put it this way. So now we, we, we talked about the fact that what we ended up with here was a stratified society where the closer you were in approximation to European, the more likely you were to be able to have access to success, right? It wasn't 100% guaranteed, right? But the possibility existed, and there were a lot of people who did benefit from it. So, yeah, you did have light-skinned pe people who did think that they were superior because they were closer in phenotype and skin color and manners and custom to the master. And they would treat the people around them with disdain. That is something that did happen, and it still happens to this day. How do you know that, truth teacher? I'm glad you asked. I, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> Just rock and roll with it, damn it. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. The reason why I know that is because even though Jamaica is a predominantly black country, there is um, a significant mixed race community. And I just so happen to belong to that community. I know for a fact that we were used by the British as a buffer between the pure or darker skinned Africans and the white class. So when you go to Jamaica today and you look at the population, you'll notice that the upper classes and the middle classes has a very strong mixed skin people are mixed people are disproportionately represented in that demographic. 
Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely is a thing. You know, yeah. you see it. And it becomes a little bit complicated because class, you know, when you talk to Jamaicans about it, they'll say, oh, well, no, you know, racism is not so much racism in our society as it is classism. And that's true, and it's not true. It's true in that, yes, Jamaicans are extremely, extremely class-conscious people. Um, but here's the thing. It becomes a conundrum, right? Because if the people who had the most access to opportunities for wealth and opportunities were mixed race people, and now there's a class prejudice, it's like means that by de facto, a lot of times, people who are of darker complexion are being discriminated against because they are perceived to be in the lower class, but they're in the lower class because they didn't get the opportunities to advance at the same level that the mixed people did. So you, you understand what I'm saying? No, no, I get you. I get you. I get it's, you. It's a conundrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get but you. But if you are a dark-skinned person and you do make it into the upper class, you are more accepted than a dark-skinned person who is in the lower class. Yeah. Now, you know, now, like... now let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me just add on to, well, ask you something else. Um, in, in dating... Right, I've seen. Yeah. I've uh, you could probably I don't know if this happened or if you heard this happen, but I've, I've in the in the Latin community, also in the black community, I've seen it firsthand mm -hmm. that if you date somebody white, oh shit, you can't do no wrong. Literally, that white person cannot be college educated or even high school educated. Not, been dropped out of high school as long as they're white. Oh shit, you know what I mean? They can't do no wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So, um. Have you heard some anti-blackness uh, sediment from um, the black community talking about don't bring home no black person, you know, to the women in, in the in the black community or in the Amer uh, black oh, American yeah. community? Because I've I've personally seen heard, you know, mothers talking about like don't bring home some somebody black, you know, bring somebody like somebody light or whatever the case is. And that always confused me. Yeah, don't me. date nobody darker. Don't date nobody darker than you. Yeah, that that always confused. I don't know. We don't me. know nothing. Yeah. That always confused me. We don't me. know yeah. nothing about no nappy hair. Yeah, yes, you know, yeah, like that, all that, of that. That really confused me. So can you can you shed some light to that? Well, once again, um, you know, we're talking about that mind virus, right? Yeah. So yeah, So yeah. if you've got that virus of white supremacy and when it becomes people of color we're talking about um we call it colorism but really what it is it's still white supremacy you know um if that's the idea that you have that the lighter in complexion you are the closer in approximation to european ideals that you are the better you are then why would you want your children to dark you know, to d date people who are more distant from that. Yeah, a yeah, lot of yeah. times it was, it was a survival strategy for parents. It's like, you know what? I'm a dark-skinned person. I've gone through hell in my life. I don't want my children to go through the same struggles that I did. So if they marry somebody lighter or better yet, if they marry somebody white and the kids come out more white, they're going to have an easier time in life than we did, you know? So <clears throat> all of that happened. You know, if um, people want to do some more research on this, I would say there's a couple of books that you should read. There's one, hold on a second. Let me go over to my library. All right. So the book um, for people who want to research on your own, there's a book, it's called Our Kind of People by... Lawrence Otis Graham. He's talking about 
in this book, the the black elite, the African-American black elite. He's talking about the middle class and the upper middle class. And he's talking from firsthand experience because he's a member of this class. And they go into all of this, you know, history about, you know, skin color and all of this stuff, you know, and why they uh, choose certain marriage partners and, you know, based on color and all of this. Another book, a really good one. Um, this one is called One Drop, written by Bliss Broyard. She's talking about finding out that her father was a Creole man. He passed for white. Um, she never knew growing up that uh, her father was actually a Creole of color from Louisiana and that, um, you know, he was a person of African descent. She was on um, Louis Gates' program, and they did her DNA. It came out she's 30% African. She didn't know that. Wow. But, you know, her dad was um, a Creole from Louisiana. He was very light-skinned. Came up to New York, and he passed for white. Married a white woman, had some white kids, and they lived in the white world. And it was on his deathbed, well, actually, when the father died, that the mother told him, you know, their their actual lineage, you know. And she found out, and then she started doing research about, you know, his life and why he made the decision to pass for white. Um, another good book to read, um, Cane River. Um it is written by, it's a novel, but it takes place in Louisiana, and it's kind of based on real-life circumstances for the time. Uh, Lalita Tademy, that's spelled L-A-L-I-T-A-T-A-D-E-M-Y. Um, another good book by Shirley Taylor Hislip, Finding Grace talking about um, two sisters, one who passed for white and one who stayed in the um, the black community. Um, so, yeah, this, these things exist here in the, the, uh, the African-American community. They still do. Gotcha, um, gotcha, gotcha. I have a history of it myself in my, in my family. Um, how do you know that truth, teacher? Yeah, I'm glad wait, wait. you asked. Now I'm at, no, 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 no. I'm asking now. No, no. I'm at, how do you know that? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I happen to know that because in my family, we have a history of a relative who passed for white. So on my father's side, <clears throat> his grandmother, my great grandmother, um, after her husband died, she came to Canada. Um, her mother, I believe, was either white or very, very white. Well, mm, her mother must have been mixed too, but very, very white, you know? And um, she came to Canada and she passed for white. She ended up marrying an American man and they came to New York. Now, the problem here was that my grandmother was not able to pass. So my grandmother was just a little bit too tan to pass. And so she had to leave my grandmother in Jamaica and that really screwed with her mind really bad. She, um, did not do too well psychologically with that. She married my grandfather, who's also a mixed person. But the thing is, it's like when they had kids, it's like every other kid would be dark. You know, so there'd be one light, one dark, one light, one dark, one light. Um, she tried to push all of her kids into marrying light or white people. Um, my father was the lightest one in the bunch, you know, like really white skin, um, like kind of bluish hazel eyes. 
And um, my grandmother was so convinced that he was going to marry this German girl. And when he showed up with my mom, oh, my God, she lost her fucking mind. He was like, if you ever marry any black girl, I'm going to call immigration upon you. <laughs> and he was like, um, well, you can go ahead and call whoever you want to call because, you know, the British Army already did my papers, so I'm good. Yeah, 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 yeah. My grandmother, oh my God, she hated my mother's guts. She hated her guts. She hated her guts so much. Um, she wanted her child to marry white. My aunt, same thing. She wanted her to marry white. Um, I had two, well, two of my aunts. One was darker. The darker one couldn't stand her guts. I mean... The lighter one, she sent her up to the United States to go to nursing school. The darker one, she kept back in Jamaica, and she sent her to a school to be a seamstress. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the darker one, she was like, well, you know what? Fuck you. She came to the United States, and she put herself through school, and she got herself a decent career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the lighter skin one... She got with this white guy and I guess, you know, her own way of getting revenge at mom, she made this man's life miserable. <laughs> she like, he was like a, a nightclub owner. And um, the fucked up thing is he really loved her, but oh my God, she just made his life miserable. She treated him like dirt. He would be like, my mom told me that. He would be crying, you know, because she treated him so bad. And But, you know, that was her way of, you know, they all, in some way or another, kind of resented their mom for what she did. But it still left a mark on the family. Now, yeah, crazy yeah, thing is it, that... Isn't that part of the... Isn't that part of that whole psychological aspect of white supremacy? Yeah. There's a big psychological element there. And, you know, so this is why I call it a virus of the mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's an infection. And the thing is that, yes, a lot of lighter-skinned people have accepted, well, they're not the only ones, but what happens is that, unfortunately, you have lighter-skinned people who either adopt this mentality or they start getting, you know, treated, you know, like they start getting like little favors, you know, certain things are easier for them in life. And then the darker skinned people, what does that happen? What happens there is they start to resent, you know, those people that are getting the preferential treatment in certain circumstances. So, you know, it's, it's just like when you have kids, right? You yeah, know that the, when you have easiest, kids, if the you buy a job, uh huh. No, no, it's a joke. That's if, a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, when you have kids, they're going to come out to be just like you, and then you're going to see. You know, when you have kids, if you buy something for one kid, you got to make sure you buy something for the other kid, too. Yeah, that's true. That's because true. if not, what's going to happen? They're going to be a fight that's mine and all this other stuff. So there you go. Yeah. So now, can you imagine a society? where you've got two people or two groups of people and you give in a certain amount of goodies to this one. Now, mind you, the goodie that you give in to that one kid, it could be your old hand-me-downs, you know, your half-broken tractor or whatever. But the point of the matter is you gave something to that one kid and the other kid didn't get anything. Who's the kid going to be pissed at? Yeah, yeah. Now, logically, they should be pissed off at dad because you bum, you didn't give me nothing. But what usually <laughs> happens? You yeah. take it out against your brother or your sister. The, the siblings, Ooh, yeah. Oh, dad loves you more than me. Well, I'm going to fuck you up. That's how I'm going to deal with it. Yeah. I'll show you. Yeah, well, and this is why we got this light skin, dark skin beef yeah. going on. Now, 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 let me let me ask you because you know we've been talking about this for for a minute um mm -hmm. 
what what is what do you think about this whole what's the solution for this whole anti-blackness in the black community what's the whole solution education we should just be uh, more uh, uh, mindfully opened uh, about certain things knowing that we are historically infected by white supremacy like what is the solution well you know the thing about it is there is no one solution because the problem itself is multifaceted. So a part of the solution is education. A part of the solution is spiritual. A part of the solution is emotional and psychological. So in other words, it's gonna take work. It's not an easy thing. It's not gonna go away overnight unless people make a concerted effort to work on these things. And that's not easy. It's not easy to face yourself in the mirror and to admit, you know what? I don't really love myself the way I should because of X, Y, Z. It's not an easy thing to look in the mirror and say, you know what? I got some fucked up ideas about other people and I got a superiority complex, you know, because I look a certain way, and in certain instances, I might get treated a certain way. It's not an easy thing to admit that, you know, I have said some fucked up things to people because I was taking out my own self-hatred or my own frustrations on them. I made them the scapegoat. It's not an easy thing to admit that, you know, we are broken and we need to be fixed. Yeah. And and do you think, do you think like just small steps like education, teaching our children that, you know, being black is beautiful and all this other stuff. It's a good way of uh, going about it. That's a good way of going about it, but we have to be careful because usually what happens and what has happened in our society is that in our attempt to to even out the scales, right? Because we recognize that black people or darker skinned people have been on the bottom. We think that, okay, well, that means now I gotta shit on the light skinned people in order to balance things out. And no, we can't. When all is said and done, we have to keep in our minds in the forefront of our minds that we are a family. So it's not that I'm gonna, you know, put down light skinned women so that I can elevate my queen. It's that the black queen and the light skinned woman are our sisters. The light skinned person and the dark skinned person, these are our family members. We are all family. Yeah. We need to evel- we need yeah. to appreciate each other for all our differences and I think that is part of our strength is the variety of different colors and phenotypes and hair textures. That's what makes us so beautiful. We're like a bouquet of flowers. Yeah, you know, yeah, if yeah, you yeah. just have a bouquet and everything's the same, okay, well that might be nice, but what makes us so rich And interesting is all of those combinations that we have. We need to appreciate all of the differences that make us who we are and put it on an equal footing. It's not about I'm going to put one group down and raise another group up because at the end of the day, you're talking about your family. And even within our families, skin tones and phenotypes can range from almost European to completely African looking. I mean, like if you saw me and my brother together, you would never think in a million years that we were related to each other. So let let, let me just start wrapping this up right now. Um, let me start. Let me let me start wrapping this up right now. You know. Um, mm-hmm. Now, this was a great conversation. I really enjoyed everything that you you said. There was a lot of insight that you that you put put out there and that I, that I definitely agree with. And, um, things that I was actually like, yo, that actually makes a lot of sense, you know, because Mm -hmm. white supremacy is a, it's a mental issue, even though, you know, implemented in, into us, um, what get, tell the people where they could find you. 
You can find me on my channel, um, Truth Teacher 2007. And like I said, um, I'm not a very prolific content maker, um, but I think my greatest contribution are the playlists that I've created on my channel. Um, everything that you need to debunk white supremacy, yeah. you're going to find it there. That, yeah, you know, yeah, you're yeah. going to find, and you know, I focus, you know, I don't exactly have the most beautiful head of hair on the face of the earth, but I do have like hair videos. And the reason why I do that is because hair is one of the things that was used against us to uh, make us feel bad about ourselves. You know, they told us, you got the bad hair. So even yeah, though yeah, that's true. I, even though I got the light skin privilege, I got the bad hair backlash, <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. conversely, my little brother, who's really dark skin, he had the quote unquote good hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. he experienced some things that I didn't experience, but then, he got the people that would put him up on a pedestal because he had the good hair, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I have the, the hair videos there yeah. to teach, you know, like, love your, our hair is beautiful. Yeah. You know, yeah. our hair is beautiful. And I want people to embrace, I, I'm so happy to see all the sisters out there rocking the naturals and the dudes growing out their hair and doing all the interesting yeah, some, things some with dudes, it. Some dudes be losing their hair. You know, they got to start wearing lace fronts for guys. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yo, I know a lot of people clown me because I got a big forehead. I'm not losing my hair. I was <laughs> born this way. I got the baby pictures to prove it. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I've got other videos in my collection um, to show the contributions that people of African descent have made to society because that's another yeah. thing that you know, a, a, lot, a lot of people of don't. Puzzle. Yeah, a lot of people don't really talk about or like to know about. You know, um, exactly. What a so. Um, and one last thing. Um, leave us out. Leave us out with, with with some affirmations, bro. Since you're santero and all that, leave us out with some affirmations. Some affirmations, damn. I don't know. I. <laughs> well, I would say this. For all of my brothers and sisters out there, if you are African American, if you are Afro Latino, if you are, uh, let's say, wherever you could be, you could be Afro Arab, you could be Afro Persian, Afro Turk, wherever you are, people of African descent know this. You are second to no one, you are just as good as anyone on the face of the earth. And you have a very long history to be proud of. For my African American brothers and sisters in particular, I want you to do me a favor and stop this shit about we don't have any history, we don't have any culture, because you do have a history and you do have a culture and it is just as rich and just as vibrant as any other culture on the face of the earth, you are not second to none to our brothers and sisters on the African continent. What you created was something very beautiful, very dynamic. You have made contributions in history and science, technology. And if you go down in my playlist again, you will see all of the inventions that we have made to modern society, which people don't talk about, the scientific contributions that we've made. Everybody talks about the music and the sports and all of that, but nobody talks about the scientific, technological, medical contributions that we have made to world society, not just the United States, but the entire world. Yeah. Second yeah. to no one. Yeah. No one. And whether you're light skin or you're dark skin, love yourself. But to my light skinned brothers and sisters out there who are dealing with your manifestations of white supremacy, and we all know who it, I'm talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would say this. Um, I do not doubt that you have experienced some really painful things in your background, in your history growing up. But what I would like you to realize is that 
we're all hurting, okay? This system of white supremacy did not leave anybody unscathed. We're all hurting. And just as much as things have happened to you, yes, those things were very real. They were very wrong. And I'm sorry that you had to experience that. But our darker skinned brothers and sisters have also experienced things as well. And the fact of the matter is that because of this mind virus, we have been hurting each other. We are both guilty of doing and saying things to our brothers and sisters that were hurtful and harmful. And now it's time to recognize the legacy of this thing, recognize where it came from, and start working on ourselves so that we can stop this cycle of pain and stop hurting each other and begin to lift each other up. We are all lovable. Mm. We are all beautiful. We are all worthy and deserving of love and life and happiness. And that's what I wish for all of you. Mm, yo, talk that shit, truth teacher. Yo, talk that shit, yo. <laughs> now nah, bring that, some that ashes. Bring some ashes. Bring some ashes. Don't want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> you stupid. Listen, everybody that that's listening, um, truth teachers, uh, YouTube handle, everything's gonna be in the description down below or in the details on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. And truth and teacher, you can find me on Instagram too yeah. under Truth Teacher Two Thousand and Seven. I'm joining the twenty first century. I'm also on Twitter. I'll I'll link. Couldn't I'll quite link his, figure uh, it out. I'll, I'll link his yeah. Instagram. I won't link his Twitter. I'll link his Instagram also so you guys can follow and everything. And Truth Teacher, listen, thank you for stopping by. You're welcome. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview that was with Truth Teacher 2007. Remember all the links on the description down below for his YouTube and Instagram. Um, you know, or if this is on the podcast on the detail part of the you know podcast app remember you can find me at instagram and twitter at the same name radical underscore latino underscore and you could pro you know support your boy cash app at dollar sign radical latino and also hit up my website i did this website for us radical latino.com all right peace